Good morning. We are coming to you live from the New Forest in the south of the UK. We've had to move pretty swiftly um, from our usual location to hide out in the barn because, well, it's raining, isn't it? It's a bit grey, isn't it? It's very grey. It's a bit grey. But it's quite good. Lots of areas in the UK at the moment are really dry. Yeah. Um, so this bit of rain is very much welcome to help kind of enliven things up. It's going to re-lush. It's going to re-lush the countryside. It started mm. off very green and very lush, but then that little dry mini drought that we've had has been a bit tough. None of my wildflower mm. seeds are coming up. We are in the barn. You might be wondering why I've got my hat on as we're not outside. Uh, that's because I haven't brushed my hair today. <laughs> And that's typically why you'll see me wearing a hat. If you're on spring watch and I've got a hat on, it's not because I'm interested in keeping my head dry. It's because I haven't brushed my hair. Things are going downhill. You can uh, see look, it's pyjamas a, It needs cutting. Look, it's just, a, I look like a scarecrow. Like an absolute scarecrow. You were meant to cut it over the weekend. And then yesterday, you've not got your scissors out. Well, I'm not going to just like pounce on you with scissors. You need to, you know, if you let me know when you want me to do it, I'll do it. Oh, you it know, be it's easy. Dumb. Look, this bit, of the, this bit's the really tricky bit. Oh, put your hat back on. I'm going to put the hat back on. Okay, but on. let's get back to those peregrines on Wakefield Cathedral because that is a sensational view of one of the world's most sensational birds. Of course, absolutely mm. beautiful views of them there this morning. Now incubating that clutch of eggs, they just look so good, don't they? They're just oh, spectacular. Sweetie blue, those markings, <laughs> beautiful moustache. I was looking at it this morning, I was just thinking, you know, it's one of my favourite birds. And then I sort of thought, yeah, but then so is Drake Snew and Yellow Wagtail and Bullfinch and Barrel. But peregrines, right? peregrines are so up there. And we were really lucky because Wakefield have sent us in some brilliant clips showing us all of the different types of courtship behaviour that they've seen these birds display. Now, the first one is really interesting. It's when the male bows down, he lowers his head, he lifts his tail feathers like this, and he calls the female in. So the first bird that you're seeing in that clip there is the male. The second female, the female then comes in, and she also bows her head down. And what a beautiful thing that is. Of course, Fantastic. it's all about um, strengthening that bond between the two before they breed and lay an egg. Mm. But there's something they have to do before they can lay an egg, isn't there? Well, they have to copulate, of course. Well, they do have, there is that. They do have to copulate, but mm. they also have to create their scrape, their nest. Oh, yes. And um, this is something that you can see with this behaviour. When they're hunkering down, they move their wings like this, they lower themselves down and they scrape a bowl. Um, peregrines normally nest on the edge of cliff tops and things like that. Um, often where there's no kind of real substrate, they don't build a nest, they don't bring in material. So they have to make that bowl, that cup shape, um, in, in the ground there. Yep, scraping away, cool. scraping away, top work. I tried that bowing and lifting my tail to try and attract females and uh, was arrested. Anyway, <laughs> we've got another clip uh, here, and this is of the incubation process. Mm -hmm. Now, both of the sexes take part in the incubation, and data from Wakefield this year shows that the male has incubated to date 102 times, average mm -hmm. 3.4 times a day for one hour and 40 minutes, giving a total of 171 hours and 34 minutes hard work by the male. It's not bad. Not bad, not bad, but I'm afraid you can't hold a torch to the female. 548 hours and 26 minutes she has been sat mm. on those eggs and they are due to hatch, we think, or hopefully. Mm. At uh, some stage tomorrow or Thursday, mm. so fingers crossed that will be the case. The bit, you know, the disparity there between the, uh, you know, the male's incubation. He's putting in a good stint, there's no doubt about that. And the females, it's a bit like the washing up rotor mm. in the kitchen just over there. It's not that. It, I'm telling you. Next, put a post-it on the fridge so that we could note who was <laughs> doing the most washing up. Mm. That was a mistake. Well, was it? Really? Because the data determines that the washing up. It's very definitely been done by the male of the species. Well, that may be the case. However, I have my own secret post-it of my own, which dictates how many times you've made dinner. And guess what? The female of the species is winning there. Talking about but... making dinner, look at this third <laughs> clip, because this is where they're bringing food in to that nesting platform, the male providing for the female, of course. So it's like he's not do, you know, hanging around doing nothing. He's not sitting on his tail feathers, I don't know, watching Netflix or something, is he? He's busy out. He's hunting for that female, bringing in those food resources so that, of course, she can be more successful in incubating those eggs. Yeah, she doesn't have to get off. Um, it keeps her body weight up, her body fat levels up. Mm. You know, and obviously, the, that courtship feeding has been going on long before they've laid the mm. eggs because her condition would determine how many eggs are laid and how well she can incubate them and ultimately... Therefore, how many of them will hatch and survive. So courtship feeding is really important. What's great about the webcams is that you get to see what they're bringing in. Mm. And the peregrines are out there sampling all of the bird fauna. 
and we've seen there little greed that was one of the, the play items and red shank too one thing that when we started first watching these urban peregrines with our cameras is that people were seeing a lot of birds which couldn't possibly have been living in that area and we wondered where the peregrines were getting them from it turned out they were hunting at night these birds were flying over the city they were using the lights of the city to go up and uh, hunt them whilst the birds were migrating. So we've learned a lot actually mm. about um, you know what is moving above our cities, and uh, and that's because of the peregrine sampling. Dropping a there. few feathers. Should we do a quiz? Let's do a quiz. So today we are um, looking, giving you a bit of a body part as we are all day, uh, every day this week. This one, look at this. Now, I would say what type of area of the body this is, but. I mean, I think it's kind of obvious and I don't want to give it away too much because they, we're, of course, we're giving them too easy. Okay. Lots of people are getting this already. We've got well, to then. ramp it up a little bit. We said okay. yesterday we were going to make it harder. Okay, I'm going to get really nasty tomorrow. We're going, going to get, get really, really nasty. nasty. Yeah, I'm going to show the subcuticular structure of the back of uh, uh, some of swallow's retina or something like that. I don't know. We'll come up with Study something. Study your retinas, people. <laughs> if you think you know the answer to the quiz, then do send it into our social media. We'll give you the answer at the end. And yes, there will be more difficult. Now... Uh, we've got a fantastic film coming up now by a, a photographer, filmmaker called Matthew or Matt Moran, M-A-R-A-N. Um, I met him a few months ago to do one of his podcasts. He's a fantastic guy. I've got to tell you, he's really, really brilliant. He's living in London. And this story is his interaction with some foxes that he discovered when he was out with a walk, uh, on a walk with his uh, girlfriend. And he became obsessed with the foxes. And he's got some astonishing photographs and some beautiful film of them. I will tell you a bit more about Matt and what he's up to after you've watched this film. So take a look at this. I used to think the answer to getting great images of wildlife was to go abroad. I've been really lucky and visited some beautiful countries with incredible national parks, and wilderness areas, and I've had some amazing wildlife encounters. But it's taken until now, at the age of 43, to realise I was wrong. There are equally spectacular wildlife counters to be had on our doorsteps. And over the past four years, I've been photographing a family of foxes close to my home here in North London. And I've had some of the best experiences of my life. They all started with a chance encounter. My partner likes to walk after dinner. I'm never really in the mood. I'd rather veg out, but she's right. It's good for digestion and we were walking uh, along a street we'd never been down before, turned a corner and saw these two foxes hanging out on this green. And the backdrop was perfect. Beautiful, unbroken terrace of Victorian housing. So I ran back, grabbed my cameras, and that was really the beginning of this beautiful relationship. The very first fox I photographed was a vixen, and I'm still photographing her today, which is extraordinary given her Urban Fox's average lifespan is only 18 months. She is the bravest and most beautiful fox. She has this confidence about her. And she was the subject of almost all my early photographs. I was doing this for about six months, going back night after night, talking to the foxes in the hope that they would get familiar with me, wouldn't see me as a threat. That way I could get intimate portraits, kind of stuff that I was looking for, and the hope to start to build up a significant body of work. I've always loved foxes, so this was an opportunity for me to learn more about their behaviour in the city, so that I could then in turn educate people. I wanted to show that these are animals just trying to survive like us. They need food, shelter, water, and somewhere safe to bring up their young. A year later, I was really fortunate and I got access to an allotment close by where the foxes were living. And that's when things really started to get exciting. I was seeing cubs play fighting, their uncle and aunts interacting with each other from previous years. And of course the vixen, this was her domain. And following the family life and all the politics and trying to capture it all on camera has been a total joy. So last summer, the vixen was on her third litter and it was such a privilege and a wonderful experience to 
watch her bring them all up and get to see and photograph their different personalities and behavior. Of course, there's also the reality that it's a tough life for a fox out there and many of the cubs don't make it beyond just a few weeks. Foxes are divisive creatures. I understand that, but I feel it's my job as a visual storyteller to shed some light on the truth. You, know, you hear people say, but they dig up my garden. I said, well, that's because they're storing food. They're not doing it to annoy you. As far as a fox is concerned, that's its territory. And they're saving food for later, for leaner times. They scent mark each location. Oh, well, they make such a racket at night. And I said, well, yeah, that's because we make such a racket in the daytime. Imagine trying to be a fox, and sleeping in the middle of the day with all the noise going on in a busy city like London. Oh, but they tear up my bins and leave mess over my doorstep. Well, you need to do a better job of putting your rubbish away. The fox is an opportunistic animal. It's going to get those easy pickings if it can. But will it eat my cat? No way. Cats reign supreme in that battle. You know, looking at it from another angle, what about the services they provide? Like keeping the rodent population in check. You know, I think the fox is a great example of an animal that can spark interest in natural history for a child or someone that doesn't have access to a wilderness area. What is a predator? Why are they here? What does it eat? Where does it live? These are all great questions in learning more about the wildlife on our doorstep. I think there's still a lot of work to be done to help people understand how to live alongside foxes. After all, they're here to stay, so let's open up our minds. The fox has done this to great effect, adapting and, and establishing itself in our towns and cities. And there's still so much to learn about these enigmatic animals. This is one of our last great terrestrial predators. We hunted everything else to extinction, such as bears, wolves, lynx. But this is an animal that has been persecuted its whole existence and has still managed to survive. So let's get curious about the fox and start sharing more positive stories about an animal we are very lucky to have living alongside us. This year I was curious to see whether the vixen had made it through another winter. I saw what looked like the entrance to a den, set up a trail cam, and the footage showed a fox with five cubs. I couldn't believe it. But was this fox the vixen? And really on her fourth round of cubs? Astonishingly, yes. Looking as strong and as healthy as the first time I saw her and took those first pictures four years ago. So it looks like I'll be in for another busy summer of fox activity and I can't wait to see what the future holds for these little ones. Gorgeous. Amazing. Absolutely what a gorgeous. beautiful clip and a beautiful story yeah. about some animals around the corner of your house that you can just engage with. You know, like you said in that video, mm. they are a fantastic species, aren't they? Mm. Because they're so adaptable. They live in so many different environments. We know that there's approximately 150,000 of them living in our cities. They're something that everyone can go out and get connected to. Yeah. And that female having her third litter, mm. which is, as Matt said, you know, very unusual. They don't live that long normally in our cities, unfortunately. A lot of them get run down for obvious reasons. And, uh, and, the, and they struggle sometimes with food. Only about 50% of the food that they eat when they're in our cities is what we call anthropogenic food. It's human-based food. They're still mm -hmm. taking 50% of natural foods that they would take in the wild, rodents, birds, fruits, obviously all of those sorts of things. Great stuff, though, and beautiful photography. I just want to mm. show you this picture from his Hampstead Heath book. You can see this here. It's great photo. This is a great photograph of uh, a great crested grebe and its young swimming across the pool in Hampstead Heath with a swimmer behind it. Uh, Matt is a, an exceptional photographer. You might want to look at this book, Hampstead Heath, 
It's got lots of fantastic photographs. It's a, a cameo of a, a lot of work that he put in visiting the heath and, and taking photographs of it. And of course, that's available from all good bookshops. And Matt, <laughs> Matt uh, also runs a great website. And if you visit that, he does these podcasts. And I was very fortunate to do one of those for him earlier in the year. You can find that at Matthew Moran, as I say, it's spelled M A R A N uh, dot com. And also check out his Instagram feed. That's where he's most active with his photographs. Great photographer, top bloke. Thanks, Matthew. You need to keep up with those boxes, too. Yeah. <laughs> so we have our live cam of the day. And this one is a bit of a special one, isn't it? This is the live cam of a royal albatross. I know, superb. Royal albatross. Absolutely. I mean, come on. I know. <laughs> you can see the one chick there um, hunkering down. Now, of course, there's a bit of time difference at the moment. So we've had to get a bit of pre-record in because at the moment it's quite dark. It's in New it? Zealand. So it's a tire row ahead in New Zealand. Uh, these pictures are put up on the Cornell Lab, all about bird sight. That's where you can find them. The actual platform itself is run by the Department of Conservation in New Zealand. But, I mean, who'd have thought, you know, to watch albatross chicks live? Now, obviously, throughout the course of the day, our night, that's the time to be watching this nest, mm -hmm. there's a very good chance that the adults will come in and feed that mm -hmm. youngster. And when they do, it's, it's quite spectacular. It's worth keeping your mind on that website. Albatross, extraordinary birds as well, of course. Amazing. Seen... Well, there are two types of uh, royal albatross. There are southern and northern royal albatross, or which one this is. And they're quite difficult to separate when you mm. see them flying around, actually, as well. Pretty tricky. They are animals that circumnavigate the uh, Antarctic continent looking for their food, flying thousands of kilometres in search of that food. And they have that, the ability to maximise their um, uh, you know, sorry, minimise the, the, the use of their energy when, once they're flying about. They spend most of their energy in any sortie taking off. After that, they use a thing called slope uh, soaring, which means that they can go 50 metres forwards or sometimes up to 70 metres forwards if the wind's right, um, every time they drop one metre. So they're going up a few metres and then they're just drifting down. And they do this to cover vast, uh, vast mm. areas of the Southern Ocean. And they have a tendon between um, this part of their wing and this part of their, uh, of their wing. So they sort of click it into place like that. So then they don't have to use any muscle strength to hold their wings open. It's all just being held there by uh, a tendon. Uh, great. Mm. Well, they're very famous, aren't they, for wandering albatross, of course, the largest wingspan in the world. The mm. upper range of that is 3.5 metres. The royal albatross, the one that we're seeing on this live cam, isn't far behind it. Mm. The close second. Um, at three metres. But however, if you were to weigh the birds, actually on mass, the royal albatross weighs more than the wandering. Does it? It does. Yeah. Know that. It wow. Does. Look at some bit of a bulkier bird. Bit, bit of a bulkier bird. bird. We exactly. can't accuse our next guest of being a bulkier bird. I'll tell you, I've never seen anyone concentrate so oh, much, so much on Pete Fick. <laughs> I think at the moment, um, I've, seen, I've heard a rumour that she's jumping around to 1980s Jane Fonda workout. She is, of course, it's the great. one and only Michaela Strachan, looking very fit and healthy and sunny in South Africa. Michaela, good morning. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. In just a minute. But first of all, can I tell you, five weeks of lockdown here in Cape Town in South Africa, pretty similar to yourselves. The good news is they're relaxing it a little bit on Friday. So on Friday, we're allowed to go out and walk the dog. Yes, <laughs> we're allowed to exercise outdoors. And uh, the best thing, which has made, well, I don't know, a collective sigh of relief from South Africans, is we can buy alcohol again from Friday. <laughs> For five weeks, we haven't been able to buy any alcohol, only from the supermarket. So I know that my supermarket only sells wine, but I'm happy with that because my stocks of Chardonnay have got a little bit low. But Chris, I've got to say, I'm Megs. You know, I think this five weeks of lockdown has sent everyone a little bit do lally and a little bit more eccentric than they usually are. And if you follow Chris on Twitter, you will know that every night at midnight, he does his punk rock midnight tweet and chris has got this incredible selection of punk rock singles and you can imagine immaculate all in alphabetical order in his drawer and i mean we all know that he loves punk rock music but i have never ever seen him do this before have a look oh no <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know, is that, is that dancing, Chris? That jiggling around sort of movement that you're doing? I mean, I, I have, in the 28 years I've known you, I have never seen you dance or sing. 
<laughs> what has happened? You've gone completely nuts in lockdown. <laughs> I, 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 all, I say, all I can say is that our stocks of Chardonnay have not hit rock bottom. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's only something you tend to see it, when you get to the bottom. Of the and, it, and it's midnight, and, you know, <clears throat> by that stage, yeah. Um, I but still... what are you wearing? I think we all want to know, what is that that you're wearing? It's my Neil Armstrong top. Do you, do you sleep in that? Is that your pyjamas? No, you... I just, it's my indoor wear. I, I always have a, a, a sort of a an outfit that I wear when I'm indoors. I do, when I first met Megan, I used to have this wonderful pair of yellow oh, shorts. Oh, the yellow shorts, they were like a mustard colour. They were really thick. I think my mum actually burnt them. They burned them. They burned yeah. them because I wore them every time. I didn't understand that As, Asperger's <laughs> people like myself like to have something which is the same all the time. So when we go in, you know, or when I go in, I put exactly the same trousers and the same top on uh, as soon as I get yeah, home. Yeah, they were falling apart. You'd worn them for about 10 years and they were just, I mean, they were Oh, what's this got to do with yeah, wildlife? Anyway. Let's, let's move, move on, move on. <laughs> so while you have been singing away to the Sex Pistols, as you say, I've, I've done a little clear out of my garage and look what I came across. All these workout videos from the <laughs> 80s. So this is what I've been tweeting. I've been tweeting about Jane Fonda, Jerry Halliwell did yoga. There was even um, Anthea Turner did the Y plan. So, Chris, I thought maybe you and I could do the really wild show workout, <laughs> the Hitman in her huff and puff, <laughs> the spring, that spring watch workout. But I am very disappointed because I did a charity Zoom Jane Fonda workout on Sunday, which I did tell you both about. Neither of you were there with your leg warmers and your bandana. <laughs> Neither of you were jumping about to Jane Fonda for charity. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but I did it and a few people did join in. But I have to be honest, I did hurt my Achilles and ended up limping <laughs> for the rest of the day. <laughs> which, meant, which meant that I could go and look in my garden for wildlife and be a bit calmer than the, than the mad Jane Fonda workout. And look, though, I'm really excited by what I saw, because look at this. This is what I saw in my pond on Sunday. It's a western leopard toad. Now, these are endangered, so really excited to see it in my pond. I haven't had one in my pond, I reckon, for about five or six years. They grow quite big, about the size of your hand, they're about 140 millimetres and they're really heavy frogs, heavy looking frogs and they've got that very distinctive leopard print sort of pattern and each one is unique to the, to the toad. Did I say it was a frog? It's a toad, it's a, it's a leopard toad. And um, they tend to be very secretive and you don't normally see them until it gets to August. So again, I was really lucky to see it now. In August is when they start mating and they, they head to ponds, um, usually from people's gardens, and they head to ponds to do this mass mating. But because they've really taken over um, here in the Western Cape, it's very built up, they have to often cross roads. So many of them get run over. And so it's brilliant because they have these volunteers that go out and do night patrols and help the toads across the road. And they save hundreds of them that way. And then when the little toadlets come back, from the, the ponds uh, where they migrated to, backed into people's gardens. The volunteers also helped the little toadlets across the gardens. So, as I say, a really, really great toad to have um, in my pond. So very excited about that. Now, I know this is called the self-isolating bird club, so I'm not just going to show you a toad, I'm going to show you a bird. And I know if you've been watching over the last few weeks, I've been on a couple of times, and I've shown you some of the birds that come to the feeders in our gardens and I think we've had we've had some birds a boo-boo um a cape robin beautiful mouse bird and a wax bill but the one I was really hoping to get was a sugar bird and for some reason we haven't had them in our garden this this uh, season our neighbor however has had a lot and and have a look at them because they're they're really beautiful and they they love these flowers these protea flowers which are part of our famous boss floral kingdom that we have here um this one's a female and you can see it's got that tail. The tail is on a female about 50% of the length of its body. I must say, note to myself watching this, that once the lockdown's over and I can get out and, and go to the garden centre, I'm going to get loads of proteas and plant them in my garden so the neighbour doesn't always have all the sugar birds and I can have some of them in my garden. Because they really are beautiful, but it's the males that really are astounding. Look at this picture. Because... The, the, uh, the tail can be 65% of its body length, if not more. I mean, I think that one, it's, it's a ludicrous length, that tail. 
and they're, they're long and they're wispy and they're flowing. And what I love is when you see them fly. I mean, it's lovely to see them on the flag, but when they fly, they almost look like a kite mm. because you've got this little bird with this long sort of feathers, uh, this tail feathers behind them. They're really glorious to watch. And like the, the, um, the, the toads, the leopard toads, they also mate in our winter. You've got to remember we're in the southern hemisphere. So we're actually in our autumn now going into our winter. So they'll start mating in the winter. And then they do this wonderful display where they flip the tail, that long tail, over their backs. And, and they really sort of flap, stand away and flap their wings. So I've got that display to look forward to. And um, there's something else I wanted to show you that we get on our bird feeders. As I say, in the past, I've shown you the birds, but let me show you the mammal that we get. Now, this is very familiar to everybody watching. It's a grey squirrel. What's so remarkable about that, I hear you say? Well, I think it's because they were introduced here. They're not native to South Africa. In the same way, they're not native to the UK. They're native to North America. They were brought over from North America to the UK, and then they were brought from the UK to South Africa. And they were introduced by Cecil John Rhodes, who's a very well-known person in South African history. He was, um, he was a British guy, he was a British businessman, and then he was an empire builder, and then he became a South African politician. And he brought them over, so he had a little bit of Britain in his back garden. And at about the beginning of the 1900s, and they very quickly spread throughout the peninsula. Um, not everyone's favourite to see on their bird feeders, I know. Uh, in the UK, being an introduced species, they've pushed out red squirrels. They've outcompeted red squirrels, which means we've only got a few populations of red squirrels, which are our native squirrels left in the UK. Here, we don't have the problem with red squirrels, but obviously they can, the grey squirrels, can be a threat to nesting birds because they predate on their eggs. So they're also a bit of a problem here. As I say, not everybody likes them. I've got to put my hands up though. I enjoy watching them on my bird feeders. So those are other grey squirrels. But um, we've got another visitor that's been around in the neighbourhood. And I know you're going to love this, Chris and Megs, um, because, well, I don't know, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, during lockdown, one of our neighbours was alerted to a visitor by their Rottweiler dog who started barking madly. They called the rescue services in. They went into their garden, have a look at this. The visitor went down a mouse hole. The rescuer had to try and get it out. Eventually pulled it out to reveal a Cape Cobra. Now these are amazing snakes. I absolutely love them, but they are dangerous. Extremely dangerous snake to have in your garden. Their, their, their toxin is a neurotoxin. So they bite and then the saliva will block the neurons and then there could be enough um, of the venom to actually kill you if you don't get anti-venom in you. And within half an hour, you can really struggle to breathe. So a very dangerous snake. That one, you can see it's quite small. Uh, it's a juvenile, um, but they tend to be more aggressive than the adults because they're predated more. So really not a snake that you want in your rockery, a juvenile Cape Cobra. So even during the lockdown, um, a snake wrangler is thought of as an emergency service. So he came in, he got it out, didn't harm it. And I'm pleased to say he took that snake away and released it into the mountain where it's wild and safe and he can live his life out that snake. We actually get two venomous snakes that you can see in the garden here. The other one is a puff adder. Now, I, I haven't seen either of them in my garden, but just a couple of days ago, one of our neighbours did see one in his rockery. So there we go. There's a puff adder. So they're really around in the neighbourhood at the moment. And they're cytotoxic. So that venom will damage your muscles and tissues and it can cause enormous swelling. Also, obviously, it can kill you. So great snakes. Love the snakes. They need respect, though, and if you see them, then you need to keep your distance, particularly if you have dogs or young children. Now, as I say, I've never, I've lived here 13 years, I've never seen either of those snakes in my garden. I have seen a mole snake, which um, is harmless, so that's fine. But I have seen a Cape Cobra when I was walking my little dog, Rio, in the mountain a couple of months ago before lockdown. And we were walking and Rio was in front of me and suddenly she was sniffing in the bushes jumped back, looked completely alarmed, and I thought, that's odd, walked up to have a look in the bush to see what she'd seen, and there was this massive Cape Cobra. And then I thought, 
well, I'm pretty sure she hadn't been bitten. But I thought, would I know if she's been bitten? So I had a good look. She's a white dog, so I had a good look on her fur. Couldn't see any bite marks. She was absolutely fine. She wasn't behaving weirdly. Took me 10 minutes to get to my car. Then I phoned the vet just to be safe. And I said, would I know? And they said, well, not necessarily, because the fangs can be so fine that you might not be able to see it on your dog, particularly like my dog is long haired. And I said, but surely she would have reacted by now. And he said, sometimes they don't start reacting until it's too late. I said, so should I bring her in? Yes, bring her in. How long have I got? 20 minutes, 20 minutes before your dog dies. I'd already taken 15 minutes to get to the car and phone the vet. I had five five minutes to get to the vet. So now I'm panicking. Got to the vet, checked over. The dog was absolutely fine. So as I say, I mean, I love snakes. I really respect snakes. But when you've got a small dog, you've really got to look out for them. And if you get them in your garden here in Cape Town, it's a very good idea to get the rescuers in, to remove them and put them somewhere where they're not going to come into contact with small dogs or small children. Anyway, well, pretty exciting, though, to have that that snake rescue in our neighbourhood. Um, I'm going to finish my last clip that I'm going to show you. Is It's just one to make you laugh. It's a spur fowl. They're so cool because they have spurs on the, on the back of their legs. Um, it's also called a Cape Franklin. And um, my partner, Nick, is a cameraman. He's the one that was filming those lovely birds we saw earlier. But he also likes to think of himself as a bit of a Dr. Doolittle, and he likes to try and chat to animals. So before I play this clip, let me just explain what's going to happen. You can see that the bird, the spur fowl, when the spur fowl's not moving its beak, that the noise you hear is Nick imitating it. So he imitates it off camera, and then you see the spur fowl answer. So have, have a look and a listen. Watch. No, I just wanted to show you that because it really tickles me. And what makes me laugh, Chris, is, you know, everyone, as I say, is going a bit eccentric. In I mean, you've always been a bit eccentric, let me just say, but everyone's going a bit more eccentric than usual. You know, you're doing your dancing and you're singing in your in your funny pyjama top and, and your slippers. Um, I'm doing 1980s workouts, retro workouts, and Nick's trying to have fat chat with Franklin's. So Meg, I want to know what you're doing. And I also think it'd be great if, if the audience maybe let you know what kind of eccentric things that they're doing. Keep it clean, guys. Keep it clean. <laughs> <laughs> eccentric things, particularly if it involves wildlife. So anyway, that's enough of the, the wildlife. I'm going to uh, finish off. Before I finish off, um, before I go into this, let me just say, you know, thank you very much for having me on. Stay safe. Stay, stay healthy. Stay sane. <laughs> But now I'm going to take you on a little walk down memory lane again, back to nine. I can see Chris already going like this. Back to 1992. And um, have a listen to this, Chris. Have a listen. Now, you and I will instantly recognise that. Hopefully a lot of our viewers will as well. Um, and it's not Uptown Funk by Mark Ronson. It sounds very similar. It is, of course, the theme for the really... You know, a, a few photographs out. me oh, that theme tune honestly it's i feel like it's the best theme tune ever created i just hear that and i just get happy i just like do a little jiggle well it has been um it's great <clears throat> actually diplomatically put it ripped off by mm. a number of other recordists subsequently to that i have to say oh, yeah yeah no i do remember all of those moments of course with enormous clarity enormous clarity anyway thanks to Michaela Stratton mm -hmm. from her garden there in Cape Town are we going to do a quiz reveal we are so lots of people were getting this one right so well done to everyone um, so on Facebook, we've got Helen, Tammy, Anise, Haley, Shelby, Dave, Sharon, Terry, Tom. Twitter, Dave, Glitch, Meg, Matt, Mosey, Wild, Verity, 
YouTube, Alicia, Paula, Hannah, uh, Luke, Lynn, and Shane. Northern Gannet. Northern the, Gannet. The beak of a northern gannet, yeah. Mm. You can see the whole picture now of the two birds there. It's very distinctive, these lines across the top mm. of the bill, the top mandible here, the lower mandible here. It, it is a distinctive bill of all the bills. You know, you could have gone toucan, that's quite obvious. Mm. But the next, I'd say, mm. gannet. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Very obviously. Lots of people got that. Tomorrow, more difficult. Lots of people just got the, that. even smaller part of an even more <coughs> obscure bird. Quite good. Lots of people got that. And uh, birthdays today? Birthdays, so there are a couple of birthdays today. So we'd like to wish Michelle Cunningham a very happy birthday. Hope you're enjoying your day. As well as Sari Owens as well. Happy birthday to you. Um, so there are a few couple of questions coming in. I thought we could just do one or two, perhaps. Um, what is a bird's beak actually made up of? Um, it's, well, there's several parts. At the, at the base of it, obviously, there's bone, part of the skull. And then overlaying that, sometimes you can have some bone plates. And then mm. on top of that, you've got the, the, the beak itself, or the, the culmin, and, uh, and the two parts, the upper and lower mandible. And it's actually made out of material which is very similar to our fingernails, like keratin. keratin. So the beak is continually growing, and sometimes you'll see uh, beaks which have overgrown because they're, for some particular, particular reason they haven't been wearing out so a, a, a deformity there. And you'll often see sort of blue tips with very long bills or starlings, and I will say often, it, but those are the species you tend to, to notice it in. Mm. Um, but it does continue to grow, and if you keep birds in captivity and they're not using their beak as they would do in the wild, you actually have to trim them just like you have to trim your fingernails. Trimming a bird's beak, mm. never thought that. Mm. Um, so one more question. Uh, this is from uh, Gwen Garden City in Gwen Garden City. Um, I noticed that birds are quieter this morning. Is it true that birds hunker down and sing less in the rain? I think it is. Mm. I mean, I think they like a clear morning, um, definitely. And bear in mind also that they're starting to sing earlier. So it, it could be that if you're waking up at the same time, you've missed it. Because as we move now into the beginning of May, which is the peak of the dawn chorus uh, period in the UK, um, they will start singing earlier and earlier every day, which means you need to set your alarm clock earlier and mm. earlier. So look, I mean, the wrens are still singing here in the bar. And, um, <laughs> the still, the there is a decreased volume of sound on account of the rain. There is, there is no question of that. There it is. Yeah. 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 How about that? Gorgeous. Yeah, still going. So I think, yes, they, they, they will be reduced, but you've got to get your alarm clock out. No doubt. A little bit earlier. And nearly it's nearly do, uh, dawn course, the height of the dawn course. Yeah, it is. Dawn course gone. day is on Saturday, Saturday, actually. Yeah, so Saturday, yeah. we might be thinking we about... We might do something. Get, uh, get we might, or some Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. 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 We might Sunday. do something then. Um, but there's also a photo that we got sent into our South Wales Little Bird Club Facebook group. This was a photo of Evelyn, Will and Charlie from Southampton looking into their pond and noticing a few tadpoles. So great work, you guys. Keep looking out for those differences as those tadpoles change their bodies and grow even more. So keep a look out for that and send us your updates. Keep sending those in because we're loving seeing them all. Yep, we are. What we've got coming up? Well, tomorrow mm -hmm. we've got Lindsay. Uh, we'll be on uh, looking through the things that you've sent in, asking some questions and answering them as well. Of course, we've got the fantastic wildlife photographer Andy Rouse will be on and mm -hmm. Lizzie Gunfrit will be talking about self-isolating birding from indoors as well. Lots of live lessons for you out there. Uh, Lizzie Daly, Earth Live, Earth live lessons, lessons, check that out. And on Wednesday uh, afternoon at two o'clock, Meg and I are doing one for Lincoln University as well. So that's coming up. Uh, Three o'clock. Three o'clock. Hold on. Oh, no, it is, one, it is one o'clock. No, it's two o'clock. Well, we better check this out. Wait, when's Wednesday? Uh, next week? Is it tomorrow? I think it's, tomorrow. Next week. I think it's tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow. I'll tell you what, listen, oh. we'll get the calendar out and check, our, <laughs> and check our diaries, and we'll see you tomorrow morning around nine o'clock. See you later, Bye, everyone.